Well, hi again, Victoria Park Baptist Church. It's really good to be with you. For those who don't know me, my name's Robin. I'm the pastor at New River Baptist Church, which is just over in Islington, uh, just off the Essex Road. And it's wonderful to be able to share with you from God's Word today. I've been involved as a moderator for your church whilst you've been without a minister. It's been a real privilege for me to spend time with your leadership team thinking and praying about the next steps. And uh, today um, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 6 and some teaching from Jesus about the Sabbath, which comes up uh, through a couple of different narratives in Luke's gospel. And, uh, you know, during COVID, uh, coming out of COVID, one of the things that I get asked from time to time is lessons that maybe we've learned uh, through this time. And one of the lessons I think a number of people are trying to pay attention to is, you know, how we rest, what pace our lives go at. And, and even perhaps more importantly, uh, certainly a subject that comes up in today's reading and in, in the topic that we're going to look at today, um, is the, the idea of how do we make good decisions with how we spend our time as Christians? Uh, how do we make good decisions regarding how we spend our time. And um, so we've called, I've called the talk today, uh, Rest, uh, Relationships and Religion. And uh, you will have already had the reading read to you from, from Luke chapter six. So what we'll, we'll try and do over the next uh, 20 minutes or so is really just have a chance to uh, put those verses in a little bit of context uh, and then uh, really look back to the Old Testament and see how Jesus is interpreting uh, some Old Testament teaching about uh, Sabbath and Sabbath rest, uh, and then think a little bit more generally about good decision-making uh, before really finishing off by asking the question, well, how uh, can we make the most of our Sundays uh, and of our times or seasons of rest this year? So I hope that's uh, okay. I hope that's what you're up for uh, this morning. Let's start off, shall we, by thinking about the context. Yeah, you will know that in order to interpret any piece of literature, really, particularly history, and let's not forget Luke, when he writes his gospel about Jesus, he's writing history. He's very explicit about that. He's done his research. He's uh, interviewed various people. He's writing to this guy, Theophilus, uh, to present a case for uh, a history of, the, of this person, Jesus, and his impact. And uh, for anyone writing history, you know, to be able to look at uh, the context of who it was written to, why it was written, uh, and also to put uh, particular verses in the context of the whole gospel, it's helpful if we want to take away uh, something uh, about the meaning of uh, those verses and, and try and apply it to our lives as Christians. And, and just to say really at this point, for those of you who may not be familiar with Luke's gospel, uh, an important marker occurs in chapter four and verses 16 to 30 onwards. In, in those verses, Jesus goes to the synagogue uh, and he uh, stands up before the assembled people and he calls for the uh, scroll from the prophet Isaiah. And he reads out those verses, uh, talking about how the oppressed are going to be set free, how uh, the blind are going to receive their sight. And it's really like a, a manifesto for his ministry, his purpose, his vision uh, of why he's come, what uh, he is about. And, and from that point onwards, Luke proceeds to give examples of how that ministry was worked out through wonderful stories of healings, of lives being transformed, but also accompanying that amazing ministry, all sorts of controversy, all sorts of opposition, criticism uh, that Jesus receives. And so when we get to chapter 6, we find these two stories that are definitely linked together uh, by Luke because of verse 6, which is in the middle of the two stories. Uh, I don't know if you can remember from the reading what those two stories were. Uh, if not, I'll put you out of your ministry. The first one, to remind us, uh, was Jesus' disciples uh, picking uh, corn as they walked past this field. 
and rubbing it together in their hands and then eating it. And um, they get criticised for that because on the Sabbath, uh, which for Jews was on the Saturday, uh, was a day of rest. And in, in the Old Testament Exodus, you weren't allowed to harvest your crops on the Sabbath. And they're being accused of doing that. And then in verse 6, it says, and also on the Sabbath. And then there's this amazing story of Jesus healing this man with a withered hand. And, and again, uh, there, there, there's criticism coming at Jesus, people watching what he's going to do on a Sabbath. And, and, and we'll see in a, in a moment the backdrop to that in terms of some of the philosophical kind of reasoning that the Pharisees had about uh, what you were and were not allowed to do on a Sabbath. But I think the point of all this is we're not just supposed to notice what is or isn't lawful to do on the Sabbath or for us as Christians, what we can or can't do on a Sunday. But actually, even more importantly, we're supposed to notice who is the one uh, who is best able to say what pleases God about how uh, we spend our day of rest. And of course, Luke is arguing, as is Jesus, that Jesus Christ is the one who has uh, authority to say uh, what pleases God the Father uh, on the Sabbath. Um, we will find that um, if we go even further back, obviously, to the Old Testament, uh, that uh, there is, um, right from the beginning of the Old Testament, you know, the f opening stories of creation. We find God, of course, in uh, Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3, uh, having created the uh, universe and, and everything in it. On the seventh day, he, he takes a rest. And there's a couple of Hebrew words in, in Genesis chapter 2 that relate to the idea of rest that I think are helpful for us as we think about uh, what it's important that we pay attention to uh, in terms of observing uh, times or seasons of rest. The first word is the word Shabbat, which uh, informs that, that uh, word Sabbath, which appears in Genesis 2 verse 2 and literally means stopping work. It's that time where you put the tools down, where you uh, put the uh, toolbox uh, back where it normally stays and, and you stop. Uh, and then the second word, uh, which kind of gets used a little bit in, in, uh, in, in concert with that first word, Shabbat, is, is nuak, is the idea of to settle or to dwell. In, in chapter 2, verse 15, God settles or dwells uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And that's to be a place of rest for them. The idea of settling or dwelling uh, carries with it that idea of relationship. We're to rest, we're to uh, be there dwelling together in a, a place of rest. And of course, in Genesis, God leads by example. He observes a day of rest. And then in Exodus, the book that comes after Genesis, uh, the instructions given to God's people uh, by Moses uh, were to observe the Sabbath and, and give some more practical details on that, including, as I said, you know, what to do with your harvest, that you weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath. Now, of course, uh, Israel didn't pay attention to God's instructions, which, as a God of love, were given uh, to, to bless God's people and make them a blessing to others. And so we have the prophets like Jeremiah and, and Isaiah uh, criticizing God's people, saying, listen, you've uh, failed to observe the day of rest. And when, when you have taken a rest, you haven't made the best decisions about how you've spent that day. You've gone after other gods. You ha uh, you're still uh, uh, hung uh, hungry for for a material gain, uh, which you're supposed to not be running after. That's the idea of the Sabbath, is you trust God for his provision. You continue to uh, uh, participate in commerce uh, on uh, the Sabbath. Now then, uh, 
Israel gets taken into exile, returns from exile, rebuilds the temple. And then between that period and Jesus coming, you have the development of, of the Pharisees and Pharisaical ways of, of thinking about things, which were very influential for society at the time. And uh, one of the questions that the Pharisees were asking is, what is real Jewishness? And, and actually, how do we make sure we follow God wholeheartedly? Those uh, questions, not wrong in and of themselves, uh, can quite understand why people were asking those questions. But that kind of desire to have their land uh, back again, it was obviously under occupation by the Romans. Uh, uh, the next step was, well, we, we, we need to be really making sure that we're following uh, absolutely every little bit of God's law because in the past that didn't happen and we saw uh, the effect of that with the exile. And, and unfortunately, it led the Pharisees into thinking and concentrating on externals uh, rather than the heart and on philosophical debate rather than practical help. So, for example, we've heard how Jesus healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. One of the philosophical debates that Pharisees had was whether um, it was okay to jump in and, and help someone who's suffering on a Sabbath uh, even if that entailed some work. I mean, it sounds crazy for us to, to even be thinking those terms, but that's the kind of philosophical uh, debate that they, they felt they needed to have in order to really make sure they were doing every little bit of the law and not doing the bits uh, that God wouldn't want them to do. And, and the uh, conclusion that they came to was that on the Sabbath, it was okay to help someone if they would have died without you helping them. But for anybody else, any other condition, including if you've got a withered hand, uh, that can wait until the Sunday, the day after the Sabbath. You shouldn't step in and do anything about it on the Sabbath itself. And of course, Jesus uh, pays no attention to this and is, is, is obviously very sad uh, that they've come to that conclusion. Now, what we find in the story is that Jesus interprets the Bible really, really well. And he exhibits really good examples of good decision making. And I want to argue today, really good decision making is, by implication, theological decision making. That word theological sounds scholarly, doesn't it? It sounds like it's coming from a Bible college, and uh, many times it is. But really all it means is you're thinking about God. You're uh, including and involving God in your decision-making uh, process. And of course, Jesus was not coming to start something completely new. Uh, God hadn't changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But what Jesus was doing was embodying the heart of the law and what it was supposed to stand for. And he was interpreting the scriptures correctly. He was interpreting them well and he was living them out superbly in his time. That's the challenge for us as Christians today, to interpret the Bible really well and to live it out well in our day and age. And so this question gets posed to Jesus. Are your disciples breaking the Sabbath? They're not breaking the law, Jesus uh, replies, because the disciples have been permitted to do these things, to pick corn uh, and eat it uh, by the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And when that authority is then questioned, and how can you say you're the Lord of the Sabbath? There then follows this story of Jesus healing this man's hand on the Sabbath. Truly, this is the Lord of the Sabbath. God's purpose in the Sabbath was always to save and to restore. And there is just such a beautiful image of this being worked out in the man's hand being restored. So this is a good interpretation of scripture. It's good a hermeneutics, just means the message. 
uh, and interpreting the message. Hermeneutics, bad hermeneutics, bad interpretation leads people to get angry and frustrated in the face of such wonderful, life-saving, life-changing miracles as uh, this guy who's had his hand restored. So sad when that happens. Maybe you've had experiences where there's been something wonderful happening at church on Sunday and actually the person you talk to after the service, all they could notice was certain things that were not quite right about certain things in terms of maybe the organisation of the service, the way the room was looking, in terms of what people were wearing to church, in terms of how the children behaved. It's so sad. And you know, we need to be aware, just uh, as uh, Jesus and the disciples had to be aware, of dead religion that can drift in and all too easily uh, stop us from catching and running with God's purposes. You know, if you're watching uh, this service, engaging in, in worship with uh, Victoria Park Baptist Church today, I've got good news for you. Salvation, God reaching out his hand to save and restore, is especially available on a, on a Sunday, as indeed it is any other day of the week. Now, we might at this stage want to ask a question. Well, how does Jesus actually interpret Scripture really well? And, and what might we learn from that to help us in the way that we interpret Scripture? And I just want to uh, highlight a few points that I think could be helpful as uh, we think about these two questions. The first one is this, that Jesus' heart is to please Father. His heart is to please Father. He knows his purpose. Uh, secondly, he knows his purpose very well within God's wider narrative of salvation. And that combined with his heart that wants to please Father leads him into really good interpretations of Scripture. Thirdly, I want to argue that Jesus makes his decisions and his interpretations in community with the Father and the Spirit. He always wants, uh, he's always found doing his Father's will. And of course, when he gets baptized, the dove, the Holy Spirit is represented uh, resting on him. And he uh, undertakes these miracles uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit anointing his life. He makes his decisions in community with the Father and the Spirit. And then lastly, he's a student both of God, God's Word, and human beings. He's a student of God, the Father. He's always watching his Father, trying to do what his Father wills. He's a student of God's Word. If you remember when he was a child, he was uh, lost, left behind by his, his parents and they found him in the temple debating with the scholars. He studied God's word, studied the Bible, knew it well. And in this, these stories, he argues his case with reference to scripture, talking about what David did uh, when he uh, uh, fed his army with bread that was uh, on the altar. But lastly, Jesus is also a student of human beings. He watches people. He understands that people are unique. And the way that he relates to people is designed to uh, make it most possible for them to, to respond well to God's message and, and to have their lives turned around. And indeed, Luke, uh, above and beyond any other gospel writer, gives us so many of these stories of uh, people who were going in, in a, a direction that was far from God, being brought round by Jesus and, and incorporated once more in God's family. And my assertion is that if we will put these things in practice in our own lives, it will help to lead us into good ways of interpreting Scripture. If our heart is to please Father, if we know our purpose and God's wider purposes of uh, bringing salvation 
uh, to all. Uh, if we will make our decisions and our interpretations within community with brothers and sisters in our church family, if we will be a student both of God, God's word and human beings uh, and know how to relate to all three of those, it will help us to interpret scripture really well. Well, this leads us to the last question that I posed at the beginning, which really, maybe for you, is, is, is the question you really want the answers to. And, and what you're thinking about now is, how can we make the most of our Sundays? Maybe that's been a question that for you has been particularly pertinent at this time through COVID. Maybe uh, the, the, the thought of, uh, you know, how, turning on a TV set or a computer and watching a service and, and how it different that is from how it used to be uh, actually physically going to church has made you think again about how you're to spend uh, your Sunday. You know, in the French Revolution, uh, not long afterwards, there was an attempt to uh, institute a 10-day week didn't last very long this idea but in the 10-day week you had to work for nine days before you had a day off and indeed you had to work for the best part of a year before you had seven days off in that kind of system people go literally out of their mind and it's counterproductive and uh, a couple of years later the whole idea was scrapped God wants us to have a day a week, a day where we can stop, remember that word Shabbat, we can stop work and then that Hebrew word Nuat, where we can dwell with God and with other Christians. And why is that a good idea? Well, it's a good idea for, for at least three reasons. Firstly, it, it's a good idea because it recognises that God saves and restores us in that place of rest. It's not a vacuum. We're asking God to come and we're seeking him on that day. And that combination of stopping work and dwelling with God restores and saves us. Secondly, it's a good idea because it demonstrates our trust in God for our provision in life. And it just breaks that curse of avarice, of uh, the that idea that we need to keep working, we haven't got quite enough, and we're the ones who have responsibility for getting there. There is a terrible overworking culture around us today, and we need to be careful of it. Thirdly, it's a good idea to observe a day of rest because it celebrates a very important point, that our status with God and with others is not based merely on what we do. It's based on who we are, how God created us, how he rejoices over who he's made us to be, not just on what we might do for him or how well we've been doing. Well, I'm going to invite us just to pray and respond to this message today. I wonder what the Spirit has been speaking to you as we've been going through these verses together. Maybe God is calling you to put this into practice more as we come out of lockdown and including this week to stop your work, to spend time with him, with other Christians. Maybe God has also wanted to speak to you that you're valuable just for who you are. And maybe there's a message for us to carry out into the world this week that can really change the way that people see themselves and the way that they relate to God. Let's ask for God's help to do that this week, shall we? Lord Jesus, I pray for each and every person, each and every member of Victoria Park Baptist Church, each and every guest who's joining this service online today. I thank you for each and every one of them. I thank you that your heart, Lord, is to save and restore. Pray for anyone who's watching today who feels distant from you, Lord, that they might sense your spirit drawing them near. 
Lord, I thank you that as we repent, as we say sorry for our sins, as we turn to you, you never turn us away. You're full of mercy and grace. And Lord, I thank you, Jesus, that you want today to lift the burdens off our shoulders that weigh heavily upon us. I pray for new refreshing and restoration for each and every person engaging with the service today. In Jesus' holy name, amen. God bless you this week. It's been wonderful to be with you. Do uh, get back in touch with me through uh, Hilary or John or one of the other leaders and uh, I'd love to hear if um, this has really helped you today and to hear how your church is getting on over the coming weeks.